getting. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. Life is short, that death is certain, eternity long. In the silence, when you're with God, and when you feel His presence there amongst you, that something exciting might come about from that, that He might be leading you down something that is new. God has created you to be here, and He's calling you to a life of love. Strive for depth. Let's not strive for superficiality. We reflect from Psalm 90 about life and the shortness of life. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. They are soon gone and we fly away. So teach us to count our days, that we may gain a wise heart. An aspect of our shared humanity is to find places which bring us a sense of peace deep within us. I know for certain in my own life that those places have always been linked with uh, silence, with stillness and simplicity. Those places in my life which give me those great gifts I've found have been in, uh, for instance, in churches, empty churches in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, also uh, in gardens where there's lovely roses and places of beauty, and the few, or few times in my life when I've been able to go to the Australian desert in the bush area there, I've found great silences there with, with thick with the presence of God. But more directly uh, over my life, I have found that uh, walking through a cemetery for 10 years in my youth, it was very important. So there I was as a young boy and then as a young adolescent going to and from school and back to school through a cemetery. It was a shortcut, saved 10 minutes walk if I went through the cemetery. A bit scary at the start, but later on I became quite um, at home in a cemetery. You must think I'm quite foolish. <laughs> but, uh, over the years, you get to... Um, uh, sit down on the park bench at times and you start to reflect a little bit in that silence of a cemetery and I have found that uh, I didn't realize that at the time but in fact I was praying and praying quite deeply and questioning myself about where would I lead myself in my life what would I do with my life the going through the cemetery had a big effect because I noticed on a lot of the tombstones that there were people there even younger than I was then and when I had to start making major decisions about what subjects to take that would direct my course in a particular career, I know you might found it a bit foolish, it might sound a bit foolish, but I did ask the friends that live there, <laughs> what do they think? And uh, the, uh, I felt the tomb speaking out to me, basically saying, well, look, you can do whatever you like, but remember one day you're going to be, you're going to be in the cemetery yourself. It made it me realize that how short life is, that not only was uh, uh, that uh, life was short uh, but and uh, eternity long, um, but I also I was starting to think about uh, uh, about what, what, what was the really important thing to do with the short time I had in my life. Because eternity is so long, life is short, death is certain, eternity long. Later on, when I entered the seminary and was uh, studying theology, I came across some uh, of the homilies of uh, St. Uh, John Henry Newman, who for most of the 19th century became a, a leading uh, theologian in Christianity from an English background. And in one of those homilies, he said, if you really want to be able to work out what to do with your life, always remember that life is short, death is certain, eternity long. And I thought, oh, I already know this. The cemetery has taught me this. <laughs> So everybody, I'd like us to think about, uh, about what does this mean for us with the silence, to focus in on things that really, really do matter and things that really don't matter. Um, we, we often hear that uh, um, life can be uh, 
lived in a superficial manner, but life with these coming to terms with the silences can be something that gives us depth. Strive for depth. Let's not strive for superficiality. So we're nearing again the end of our second moment of our silent e-retreat, Countering Silence Deep Within. And I'm glad you're still uh, wanting to talk to me because I, I shared <laughs> about uh, the, the people in the in the cemetery talking to me. So it's okay. <laughs> I don't think I need I can to. Confirm. <laughs> yes, you can confirm. Yes, Hugh can confirm everything's okay with my mental health. So that's good. But really, Hugh, we're talking about different places where people find silence and the different types of silence, but some moments, some places, some experiences, they, you almost feel that God's there. Yeah. And the more silent, the greater the volume, if you can talk like that, of God's experience. Has that been an experience of you as well? Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, I mean, the scripture that jumps to mind is Jacob, when he you know, goes to sleep on the rock, the pillow, and then he wakes up the next morning and he says, surely God was in this place. Yeah. And sometimes there's almost a spontaneous silence and it's a place where you might not have expected God to be, um, but you just have this feeling of this sense that, of course, he's here. He's always been here. And I have only just learned of that. Um, I remember when I was just coming really into my faith, I made a, a prayer and it was a very dangerous prayer, probably the most dangerous prayer I've ever prayed. Uh, and it was to make my life a prayer. And I remember that, um, that, that little word, I think I was driving in my car at the time. And I said, God, I want you to make my life a prayer. Give me everything I need. And so it's in every moment uh, that I have that I'm silent, whether it's at my desk, uh, whether it's when I'm driving to work or, or catching the train or something like that to, to wherever I'm going, whether it's just before I go to bed or just as soon as I wake up, those moments of pure stillness and peace and silence are the moments where I can speak out to God through my words, um, but through my whole life. Hugh, you use the expression of dangerous silence. Well, what's, what's dangerous about being silent? Yeah, because in the moments where you can, in, in the silent moments are the moments where I feel like I can encounter Christ and hear him calling out the most. And you don't quite know what he's going to say. I think that's the, the, I guess the danger about it is in the silence when you're with God and when you feel his presence there amongst you, uh, calling out to you, that something exciting might come about from that, that he might be leading you down something that is new. Um, and I feel like uh, if you provide that space, and if you open your heart and your mind to God, the adventure that he will lead you on goes beyond anything you could imagine, goes beyond anything you could ever dream. As a small boy, I grew up in a devout family and I, learned to see the church from the inside. Um, I was an altar boy in the old rite and I learned that the deep silence of our churches taught me the awe and the majesty of God. That here we had God Almighty present in our church. And so um, I've never lost that. I learned that the I learned to love the red sanctuary light, which I know many others have too, because that light tells us that Christ is always with us. And as a, as a boy at school and uh, later in life, um, I was taught that we visit Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle on a, a daily basis, and that nourishes our faith and that deep pool of silence is with us. So, uh, you know, that, uh, that's a really important uh, aspect to, uh, to grow our faith. And uh, we need to find that silence. And through various groups I've been involved with, I've learned to grow my faith, to learn how to pray. And there's, there's some things that we can do to help us do that. Um, but Christ is always there and we can seek help, we can give thanks. And this is a certainty of our life of faith. And the life of faith gives us hope and hope gives us love, charity. So that is the cornerstone of, of our faith to me. Do you feel, um, Hugh, that uh, speaking on behalf of young people, I'm, I'm sure all of us do, but 
The idea of being still, silent and simple, the, these three words are very important. They go right back to the third and fourth century of Christianity where uh, people made an exodus for caves and desert places. The, the, the society was chaotic and there was a movement to a, what we would call a more monastic uh, type of solitude. The isolation was seen as an, a possible encounter with the risen Lord and they literally went into caves, but they were very happy with bringing up these three key words, stillness, silence, simplicity. Are these dangerous words, using your expression, or scary words, spooky words for young people today or not? Because they always seem to be on the move and always seem to have noise. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, it's actually quite remarkable seeing especially our younger uh, young people in the church just gravitate towards prayer in that way, in, in a simple prayer and a, uh, in complete silence, sometimes just being present in that moment. Um, and I feel like there's almost a natural inclination uh, to return to that state, to say that I just want to rest, I want to step back, I want to take notice of what God is doing in my life and I want to make a decision about where my life is going to, to go. But in order to do that, I need to just be present and still with God. Mm. Um, and so I feel like it, it's almost countercultural, yes, I guess, in a number of is. ways to what we're surrounded by constantly. But I feel like if you open up your life to that, there's a great peace that comes through being just present to God. Yes, in my teaching a little bit earlier in this session, I summarised my own personal experience as being uh, echoing that of St. John Henry Newman when he said that if you really want to have a life of depth, then keep in mind that the three, the three definite primal experiences, that life is short, that death is certain, and eternity long. To me, um, in my life, personal life, Hugh, the idea that life is short became an experience I had through walking through that cemetery in a way that was quite strong for me. At, I was only 10 and I realised people had died and they're buried there, they're six or seven years of age. Um, is this an experience for people that you know? I, I, I know a lot of people, I know that they are aware of this because they've got an illness and it's a life-threatening illness and it does change them or they've, they've moved to re or about to move into retirement and they realise that life is fading away and, you know, what has been their contribution apart from doing the necessary things in life? Is this also an experience for a younger generation or is it just for us oldies? No, I, I, it is 100% an experience. What, oldies? No, 100% oh, an experience right. for the, the younger generation. Right. That first point on, um, uh, especially when there might be illness or, or there might be uncertainty in your future, uh, that was actually my whole uh, faith journey, uh, was there was a moment of, of complete uncertainty regarding the health of myself and my mum, my dad and my brother. Um, and. And I feel like in that moment, calling out to God in the uncertainty was what led me into my faith. But if you look at that, I guess that uncertainty, there's so much of that around, especially right now. Um, and it's in those moments where you, things are uncertain in the future, where life might seem a bit short, or at least uh, what I can control in life might be very short term or very limited, that I feel in those moments, people call out to faith, people call out to God more. Um, and I feel like the other aspect of that is the truth and that there's so much almost mistruth around, there's so much information, you don't know what's truth and what's not truth. Um, and then I feel that people in those moments where they're seeking certainty amidst the chaos that the gospel provides the truth that their hearts are longing for. And in essence, it's very simple. It's that you're from love for love, that wherever you've come from, that God has created you to be here and he's calling you to a life of love with him. Beautiful, calling you to a life of love with him. Now, we are the Emmaus disciples going yes. back to Jerusalem. We're going to tell the early church, the church of today, some practical advice on the idea of finding Jesus in this, the deeper silences, the take home message. Mm -hmm. What might that be, do you think, the take home message? What, what could we advise ourselves and those that are participating in this e -retre e retreat over the next few days before the next session is there any exercise that they could look at? Uh, I, I know, um, just to preempt what you might sort of say, uh, there's always been something in um, Catholic spiritual thoughts and direction is to sort of go to the end uh, and then move backwards. So the ultimate end is, is uh, 
being at peace with God glorified in heaven, you know, the beatific vision, they talk about it using a theological term, being, at, being with Christ in heaven, with the whole church. That's our end point, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. And now we go walk backwards. So what's got to happen now for us to move towards there? Life is short, death certain, eternity long in Christ. Um, should help us with our priority, priority uh, ratings. Any thoughts? Yeah, and I think that the priority is what I was going to say, is that you're not, when, when we're moving towards the end, uh, as you're saying, and the end is a life lived with God for eternity, uh, which is something that gives us great hope. Well, it doesn't have to wait until the end. You can live a life with God starting right here, right now. But in order to do that, you really need to make it a priority. And so I, I remember when I uh, really started to take on my faith seriously, it's I had to make him a priority like any other relationship. I had to make the space and the time to allow him into my life. So there's two practical points It's to do that. It's maybe to set up a space where you know that is your time, that is your place uh, to allow God into your life. Maybe set a candle, open your scriptures, open your Bible, uh, and just allocate that place as your prayer place. And then allocate some time to do that. It might be just five minutes or 10 minutes as you begin each day praying with the daily scriptures, but allocate the time and the place to make him a priority. Great, well, we can do that, can't we, over the, between now and the next session, time and a place, allocate time and place for God. It almost seems like we're putting him into a little box, but uh, in a sense, we have to uh, find the place for him to be gracious to us. And to set, start setting some priorities now, I think that's important with our end, and uh, vision of Christ glorified, what's got to happen now for us to move towards that? That's something for us to think about as we now conclude with gratitude to God uh, for of this second session and now launch you into the next period of time when you can be silent and reflect on this important topic. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that life is short, but death is certain and eternity long with you. Give us wisdom. Give us wisdom, Lord, to know how to respond to life's challenges, how to put aside the transitory and how to focus on the eternal, you, Lord. Dear Mary, Mother of God, you yourself, lead us to Jesus. Lead us now as we place our lives in the care of your Son, Jesus, who is Lord and Saviour and lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. I'm Bishop Eugene Hurley from the Diocese of Darwin, which takes in the whole of the Northern Territory of Australia. And I'm delighted that Shalom Ministry is now in a position to bring some of that good news to the rest of Australia and indeed to the world because we live in a world where the media is so influential. It dictates so much of our learning and our attitudes. And so it's so important that the good news of Jesus Christ has to be made available to all people because it's what we each need as human beings to enliven us, to make us more loving and indeed to bring about peace in the world. So it's this good news that the Shallow Ministry is trying to get across to Australia now. Let me invoke God's blessing upon Shallow Ministry and all who work within it and all who are the subject of its good work. May the blessed Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit descend upon the Shallow Ministry and all who work in it and all their families may keep them at peace forever. Amen.